Please take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 8. Psalm 8. And let's stand for the reading of God's Word. O Lord our God, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, and thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our God, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. May the Lord bless and redeem his word. You may be seated. You know, that song always reminds me of Becky. Please take your Bibles and turn to the book of Hebrews. Now, for us here, this is kind of a silly question. But we ask the question, who is Jesus? But it's not a silly question. That is one of the greatest questions and one of the most misunderstood issues of the past 2,000 years and frankly in the prophecies that went before that for 1,000 years or more before that. Early in the Christian church, even during the, the time of the apostles this began to creep in, Greek philosophy found a, a footing and had an influence on some of the things that the churches began to teach and what the folks believed. And of course, when you deal with outside influences uh, affecting the understanding of Scripture or adding to the understanding of Scripture, you always end up with errors. And of course, Greek philosophy back in the day taught that the material world, tangible things, were inherently evil. And therefore, we had a big problem from the Greek mindset that God, a spirit being, could become a physical, tangible man with flesh and blood and bones. And uh, a lot of them thought that was just an obnoxious, awful, horrible thing. They couldn't wrap their heads around it because they had this mindset, they had this, this worldview that the physical world was evil. Now, we know that's not true. Biblically, that's not true. When God made everything at the beginning, and it was a physical, tangible world, God created the heavens and the earth, and we go through Genesis 1 and 2, and we see all the things that God did. And when he was done, he said that it was very good. There's nothing inherently evil with the physical world. Now, our present world is under the, the taint, if we can even use that uh, subtle uh, term, the taint of sin. It's been corrupted. And all that we see is corrupted. But it will be glorified. It will be good again. And that's one of the themes we're going to be looking at today. The idea of the resurrection was considered obnoxious to these people as well. If you go through the book of Acts and you read Paul's sermon there on, on, uh, on Mars Hill in Athens... And they listened to him and were, were attentive to the things he had to say until he mentioned the resurrection. And then they began to mock. Why? Because it didn't, it didn't, it didn't fit with their worldview. How could, how could this great and wonderful creator God become a man, a physical man, and then when he died, released from this physical being, this physical body, come back again in a physical body? This just doesn't work. Now again, that's human reasoning forcing itself on, on what the scripture has to say. Forcing it on, on the plan and decree of God. And we have a tendency to, to elevate human thinking that, that human reason becomes part of the equation of the scripture. There's been a number of, of people who've said that the Bible really is, is 67 books. Well really, what's that last book? Well, it's human reason. And there are people very much in earnest when they say that kind of thing. But it's not true. One of the, one of the fascinating things, 
just, just in my short lifetime, is you see the change of ideology and the things that, that for example, the scientific world very dogmatically said, this is, this is true, this is fact, They're, this is indisputable. And then a few years pass, and they don't talk about this indisputable fact anymore because they have discovered a new indisputable fact that blows away the, the, the previous indisputable fact. We don't know what we don't know. We are always changing our minds. We are always adjusting the, the facts, which means that we didn't, they weren't facts in the first place. We're constantly having to, to adjust these things. And yet God's word never needs an adjustment. It never has to go to the chiropractor. It doesn't need anything. It's right there, and we simply take God's word at face value. We do not come up with our own skewed tool, our own, uh, well, you have to read the Bible this way. Then what you're doing is you're forcing human reasoning onto the scripture. It says what it says. Take it at face value. Because to read our own ideas, oh, I have this particular mindset. It could be a theological mindset, often is. And read that into the scripture. You can come up, we can do, make this say whatever you want it to say. But if you take it at face value, if you take it in a plain sense, it says what it says. And it tells us the gospel, the good news. It tells us who Jesus is, what he has done, and what he will do. But if we come to this with our own conclusions, our minds already made up, we're going to force our understanding onto the word of God, and we will mess it up. We add to it, we subtract to it, we, we twist it, we distort it. And that's what the folks did there in Athens. That's what the, so many in the early church did. They, they read this idea into it. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 is trying to refute. Because there were some that said, well, there, there can't be a resurrection. Folks, there has to be a resurrection. Number one, because the scripture says so. And number two, because that was God's stamp of approval because the, the, the wages of sin was paid. It is finished, paid in full. And if the wages of sin is death and they have been paid in full, Jesus could not remain dead. The resurrection is a necessity as well as a historical fact. Now, as the centuries rolled by, and if you want to read some, some you just keep scratching your head, read some stuff about church history and some of the ideas that have, have come up through the centuries. It has to do with people had a particular worldview. And they look, they put on their rose-colored glasses, they put on their green-tinted glasses, they put on their blue-tinted glasses, they put on their rainbow-tinted glasses, that's what we have today. And they look at the scripture and they force their worldview onto what the Bible says. And every time you do that, you are corrupting the word of God because you are not allowing it to say what it plainly says. Well, I don't like what it says. Well, then the problem is you and not the word. And as the century rolled, rolled by, all sorts of different opinions arose regarding the nature of Jesus Christ. Now, by the time we get to our day, and frankly the, the, the last couple of generations, the prominent view, I'm not saying it's the only view, certainly not, not, not the view here. But the prominent view today is that Jesus was a great man, but only a man. Because the very idea of the supernatural is, uh, is removed from consideration. Well, the supernatural just doesn't happen. There's no such thing as a supernatural. I've never seen a miracle happen. Therefore, miracles don't happen, as if you were the judge of what is. But that's the decree of humanity today. And therefore, Jesus is just a man. He may have been a good man. He may have been a remarkable man. But he was just a man. And, of course, they remove the, the miracles, they remove the resurrection, they remove the second coming, they remove all these things that the Bible teaches is true. Now, we talked about this a little bit last time. You want to see a miracle? Open your eyes. I'll give you a couple of miracles. Number one, you can see. And that somehow, the mechanism in your brain, as well as the, the hardware that are these little eyeballs, 
allows you to see. And that somehow all the different components, all the different aspects of your eye, the, 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 uh, the, the opening of the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the degree of the opening to, to, as far as the light is concerned, your, your iris moving in and out, the, the cornea, the lens behind that, and the little filaments that hold that together and stretch that in conjunction with what's going on, the commands of your brain unconsciously to focus. Now, some of us have, have perhaps a, a little trouble with that from time to time, requiring the, the adjustments here. But when God made them, it was all good and everything worked properly. And I can see color. And it's just a remarkable thing. And I've got the, the software in the back to direct the hardware in the front, and everything works together. And yet we are dealing with literally hundreds of different components that all individually, randomly, by chance, appeared. And when it was all put together, we have a single functioning unit, actually a pair of them, that allows us to see. And we could say the same thing about our digestive system, or our ears, or anything else in the human body. It's all just random chance how all these things synthesize. Folks, miracles are all around us. Miracles are here. Creation demands a creator. All that we see is the, is the hand of God. And to say you've never seen a miracle, then you just not see it. Because your worldview will not allow you to recognize them when you see them. Human reasoning is always changing. And they always corrupt what God's word has to say. And yet God's word never changes. And God's people have never had to change their minds, never had to make, because we've got the book. It says what it says. Worldviews and everything else constantly changing all the time. Matter of fact, it seems to be going faster and faster. And yet we as God's children, we don't have to change our, our worldview. It doesn't change. It was given to us by God. And we've had God's word for 2,000 years. And God has given this to us. And it doesn't change. Now, as we saw last time, God in his word declares that Jesus is God. We see that in several different passages. Pretty straightforward. Colossians and John chapter 1. But he's also a man. He is God and man. He never ceased being God when he became man. And following the resurrection, he is the first fruits of glorified humanity. He is still, to this day, both God and man. And will be for all eternity. And he's not half God and half man. He's holy God and holy man. Now, why is this necessary? You know, we get so... The culturalization of Christmas and Easter, both of them are remarkable things that we theoretically celebrate. We distract ourselves from the incarnation with with all the, the trappings of the holiday season. And yet we, we get away from the idea that here we have the creator God. And the old theologians called this the humiliation of Christ. That God becomes a man. Isaiah says there was no beauty that we should desire him. There was nothing extraordinary about the human Jesus. It wasn't like, you know, an Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, lookalike came into the room. He would have blended in with the crowd. There was nothing extraordinary about him. Now let's look at our text, Hebrews chapter 1. Now let's go back and we're going to look at verse 2. We dealt with that a little bit last time. We're looking at verses 2 and 3 today. Let's get the running start and get the whole thing started. at verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times, fathers, spake in times past unto the fathers through the prophets, right, giving us the Old Testament and so forth. 
hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, the Incarnation, is what he's talking about. Whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, you can count them if you want, but there are seven things that he does here. Seven things. And I managed to wedge them into a five-point sermon. We'll see how far we get. He is, number one, the heir of all things. When God made things, we deal with the original creation, Genesis 1 and 2. The earth was made for man. We read that in Psalm 8. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish, or fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion, rule over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth on the earth. God gave this world to Adam and Eve. They were to be I think the fancy term is God's viceroys over this world. God is the, the king of creation. But God gave, gave this to us. He gave this to our, our first parents to rule over. In Psalm 115, verse 16, The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. This was our dominion. We were to be the kings of creation, the kings of this earth. God is the ruler of all, but man was given dominion over the earth. What happened? What happened? We seem to have lost control. Well, we did. We gave it up. We threw it away. Innocence was lost. Man sinned. And we lost our dominion, our position was lost. Now granted, we are still, to some extent, ruling over this world, but we think that's the case. It's not really. We became a slave to sin, it says in Romans chapter 6, verse 16. And with that, children of the devil. And so the, the ruler became a slave. And humanity has been in bondage ever since. And with that came death. The wages of sin is death. And so the king who would live forever and rule over a perfect world that God said it was very good. Where death was not there, there was no disease, there were no biting insects or thorns or briars, and it was all there, and there was no death, and no sorrow, and no pain. And in his self-will, humanity chose to disobey God, thinking that they could gain even more, and lost it all. And paradise was lost. And if you read Milton's book, that's basically what it's all about. Paradise was indeed lost. And Satan is presently the god of this world, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. So why do we have Jesus becoming a man? Well, he's going to be the second Adam. He is the second Adam. He will do what Adam did not. We have perfect obedience, fulfilling all the just demands of the law, according to Romans chapter 5 and verse 19. Both at the beginning of his ministry and at the end of his ministry, Jesus said, thy will be done. Always, always doing the will of the Father. And so fulfilling all the just demands of the law. 
paradise is regained. He will rule and reign, it says, for a thousand years, fulfilling all the just man's law. He will occupy the, the throne of David, it says in Luke chapter 1 and verse 32. That was the promise that was given to Mary before his birth. He will rule and reign over this fallen world, still corrupted, not glorified, not the new heaven and the new earth yet, but the old one, the one that we have now. He will rule and reign over this for a thousand years. In perfect obedience, all there in Revelation chapter 20. And then we have the new heaven and the new earth. It says in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15, And he shall reign forever and ever. And just as Adam would have reigned forever and ever, so Jesus will reign forever and ever. The second Adam fulfilling what Adam did not. It says, of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now, we often think of everlasting life, and, but it's, it's more than that. It's the, it's the extent of it. In Revelation chapter 22, in verse 5, it says that the redeemed, that's you and me if we put our trust in Christ, we shall reign with him forever and ever. And just as God had told Adam and Eve to fill the earth, Jesus, to this day, still in the act of redemption, is filling the earth with his children. And one by one we go home, until the day he calls us all home, and then we come back. And you think, through the millennia, how many millions, perhaps billions when it's all done, there are of our brothers and sisters who have gone before us and who will follow us. And we will fill the earth. And we will be under the rule and reign with our king, the second Adam. It says again in our text, He has appointed him heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. That word worlds is not the normal term. It's the idea of, of, of time and space, of things and time. Because there's no time without, without matter. They all go, they go together. Nothing was made without Jesus. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And a few verses go by, verse 14, And the Word was made flesh, the incarnation, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is God. And yet, in the same, I, one of the things that, that I find so amazing is how much, how much stuff is jammed into a brevity of words in the Scripture. If a human being, apart from the inspiration of God, were to try to communicate the same stuff that's in here, we would be looking at probably 12 volumes of this same size. God, God takes an, an amazing amount of information and puts it in a, in a, in a, in a great brevity of words. So we have this decree, this declaration there in, in John chapter 1 that Jesus is the creator. Without him was not anything made that was made, and he, had to say, and he is also God. And we have that in four verses. Jesus is God. And by the fact of him being the creator, he is the ruler. He is the sovereign of all by that very act. And as we go through the scripture, we see, and I think this is partly for human understanding and human benefit, to a large degree. Jesus is God, but he is also a man. And with his humanity, aspect of humanity, we had a promise that was made to David. 2 Samuel chapter 6, I believe it is, and 1 Chronicles chapter 
chapter 17, both the same promise. God made promises several times in the Old Testament. We refer to them as the covenants. We have in the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis chapter 15, the aspect of the, of the promised land. Look to the north, the south, the east, and the west. God said to Abraham, and all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your descendants forever. We see in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10, Jacob on his deathbed giving prophecies regarding his sons. And he says of Judah, in Genesis chapter 49 and 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. The kingship, the ruler, shall not depart from Judah, nor lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Shiloh will be the last because he doesn't end. The word Shiloh is generally understood to be him to whom it is due. And so we have David's succession. We have the hiatus. And yet we have the decree, the, 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 uh, not the decree, but the, uh, the, the uh, pedigree in Matthew chapter 1 that Jesus is the heir to the throne of David. And when he returns, as we have in the promise, promise there in Luke chapter 1 and verse 33, or verse 32 rather, that Jesus will occupy the throne of David forever. The throne of Israel, the promised sovereign on the throne of Israel. The restoration of the dominion of Adam over this lost and fallen world. Back to our text. Verse 3. Who being the, the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Now we have so many things that, that uh, I think cheat us of, of being able to be in awe of this kind of thing. If I wanted to... Um, after the sunset, if I wanted to have a little light when this was written, where did I get it? Yeah, I, I, had, a, I had a little, generally speaking, I had a little lamp about the size of the palm of my hand. And it was a little bowl, looked like a, I don't know, like a, a flattened teapot. And you had a wick, and you put olive oil in it, and you lit that, and it was basically it worked the same thing as a candle. Candles came along later, but it worked the same principle as a candle. So if I need some light, if I want to see something after the sun sets, I light a lamp. Now, candlelight does not generate a huge amount of light. Uh, we had ice storm a few years ago. We power was out for a while. And, we light our candles, and you, know, you have a dozen of them maybe to light a room to keep you from stubbing your toe on the coffee table. And uh, I remember one time we had, uh, we had uh, another power outage, and I got, I, got, I got out the Coleman lantern, and was able to read by that. But my word, that was even still, not, it's not like having you know, one of these, these glorious lights that we have today. We can turn on things, we got these, these spotlights now. And I have to look down because they, they now I've got spots in front of my eyes because I looked up at them. We have bright things like that. We see several times in the, in the scripture appearances of Jesus in his glory. And the writers are describing things from their perspective. And they will talk about the sun and snow and things that are, that are bright and radiant and so on, and it's just beyond their, their ability really to, to give it a, an adequate description. The radiance. We deal with the, the transfiguration that was seen by, by Peter, James, and John. We see John's vision of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. We see the, the Ancient of Days in Daniel chapter 7. A number of other times where we're... People saw the Lord in his glory. And they were in awe of the, the brightness. God is light, the scripture says. And in him is no darkness 
at all. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. These days we have photographs. Most of human history, if you wanted a picture of somebody, you, uh, you had to have a, a painting or what was so often done was a, an etching. And that's the idea here. All right, I'm going to pull out a $1 bill. How many have ever been to the, 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 where they make these things in Washington, D.C.? Here, my wife has been. It's, it's, it's kind, of, kind of amazing when you see a giant pallet of $100 bills. It's just like, and you talk to the workers there, he says, we just have to think it's just paper, it's just paper, it's just paper. Now, if you look and see how these things are made, they still use offset for this. At least they did when I, when I saw it. That they have plates that, that press the image onto the sheet of paper. And that's the same idea here. I'm going to ask you a trick question. It's not really a trick question. Who is that? Talk to me. George Washington. Wow. But he's been dead for 200 plus years. It's a picture of George, but it's George Washington. We understand that. That's the same idea here. God is a spirit. Well, I can't see the invisible God. And yet, at the Last Supper, they said to Jesus, Show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. And he says, You've seen me, don't you know me? Jesus is the visible manifestation of God. The disciples, every time they looked at Jesus, were looking at God. Don't try to split up his humanity and his deity. He is the God-man. Have you seen me? You've seen the Father. We deal with the Old Testament Christophanies, the pre-incarnate manifestations of, of the Lord in a physical form. But it was always temporary, sometimes referred to as the angel of the Lord, very often is. And we see Abraham's visitor, told him of what was going to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah. Joshua's captain of the host, there's a whole bunch of them in the Old Testament. Always temporary, always for special communication. But a physical manifestation of God. And with Jesus... We have the incarnation, which is permanent. And yet, there is no change in the nature of God. We have God becoming a man, but still being God. And so, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, Jesus is God in a physical form. And upholding all things by the word of his power, Colossians 1.17 says, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. That word consist means literally are held together. I mentioned in the introduction that the, the thing that, that boggles my mind is not that God made it all, although that's really impressive. I'm not trying to minimize that. But that he maintains it. After we've messed it up, he, he still maintains it. He holds it all together. He holds it together down on to the atomic level. And I suspect, I'm talking to my physicist over here, that the atomic level is about as far down as we can get, and yet it probably goes down to a lot smaller stuff than that, that we have maybe be able to deduce a few things, but it's beyond us. He holds it all together. He made it all. He holds it all together. He sustains it. The, the old deist idea that God made it and then walked away. Well, if that was the case, it would fall apart. He is the preserver. God is active and involved. 
He knows what's going on. And he actually ultimately controls what's going on. And creation needs maintaining. By him all things consist or are held together. God causes the creation to continue. If he did not, it would not. The material world could not exist apart from God's holding it together. So he made it, and by his power he sustains it. He holds it together. In his providence, and again, this is not something that's talked about so much these days, but the Puritans talked about this, and it's true. We talk about uh, God leading us. Well, that's, that's God's providence. God working in circumstances and so on to bring about a particular end. That's providence. And God in his providence restrains evil. I've shared a number of times. I, I read a book a few years ago on warfare. And how uh, starting several hundred years B.C., the different uh, things that people did uh, in warfare. You know, how, how, how can I kill as many people as possible with, with, you know, with, as much, with as little effort as possible? And that's basically what it amounts to. Warfare. And you look at how, how people got better and better, if I can use that word better, worse and worse, better and better at killing people. And killing more people. And the weapons and the means of, of, of implementing these things and, and creating machines that kill people. And we have things now where somebody can push a button and, and you can kill millions of people with the weapons we have today. Why? Even hundreds of years ago, even before gunpowder, how did we not manage to obliterate ourselves? Really? The providence of God. Restraining evil so that it does not destroy itself. That we did not destroy creation. Restraining evil so that God's promises could be fulfilled. We deal with the existence of Israel, that you have this, this little group of people that are all descended from the people of promise, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And yet God, and, through, and you look at people all around the world, they, we've got this melting pot and shifting dynamics and everything else, and you've got this one little group of people that are hated by everybody else that God made a promise to. And worldwide, I think we're back up to about 14 million of them. And God has sustained them and preserved them and protected them and maintained their cultural identity in spite of innumerable attempts to wipe them out as a people. Some going back to Bible times. I just read this morning about, you know, Sennacherib's coming, or what, I can't, what's the Sennacherib? Came to, to try to destroy Jerusalem. Isaiah talked about it being like a, a flagpole on top of a hill or the idea of the waters coming right up to the, to the mouth. And yet God preserved them. There's always been a remnant. There's always been enough to survive any attack that God has preserved the nation. Why? Because he's promised. He's bound by himself. And God has preserved the nation of Israel because he has to fulfill his promises. And so his providence, he keeps that people in existence. And he will. He must. Because he said he would. Now, what part applies to us? I know the providence and the creation and all that, but let's get down to personal. Verse 3, last part. When he had, this is the purpose, the, the primary purpose of the incarnation. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He made purification of sin. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the sacrifice of all sacrifices. 
Everything else was simply a picture, an illustration of only the one sacrifice that could actually take away sin. We, we, theologically, we call this expiation, that the sin is gone. The guilt, the consequences are gone. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And no, they won't meet when you go around the room. Opposite directions. They will never meet. One act done at one time in history deals with the sin problem once for all. And only one sacrifice could actually expiate sin. And again, dealing with the very, we talked about this last week, dealing with the nature of God, who he is, his holiness, his justice, his mercy, his love, his grace. If you're going to reconcile these things, there's only one way that this could possibly have been pulled off. And God did it. By the shedding of blood. The wages of sin is death. The satisfaction of the death penalty for sin. And yet, because he is God and greater than the sum of, of, of his entire creation, he could die for all. And he did. And the resurrection is God's certification that the penalty was paid and accepted. When he had pur himself purged our sins, and when the idea of himself is not just that he did this, but that he himself is the the purging. It's not an act that he did, it's something that he took upon himself. When this was done, he sat down. Now, believe it or not, that's important. If you go back and read Exodus, after chapter 20, all that minutia about the tabernacle construction. All the sockets and the hooks and the rings and the curtains and the boards and all this other stuff. And most of you know that you, you, you can follow that and it's a pretty good instruction manual. You can build a replica because the details are all there. You get all this stuff. How many chairs are there? There's not. And so we go to the book of 1 Kings, and Solomon built the temple. And again, you can build a replica of the temple, people have, based on the descriptions that are there. There's lots of details there. It talks about all the different things, the labors, and, the, and the, all the different stuff that he made for this, this incredible building. It talks about the, the, the decorations, and the, the cherubs, and the, the moldings, and, the, and all the, the pomegranates, and the pillars, and all this stuff. How many chairs were made? None. There were no seats in the tabernacle. There were no seats in the temple. Why? Because the work was never done. The work was never done. Sacrifice after sacrifice. Daily. Even hourly. Going on almost around the clock. Ongoing sacrifices for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it only ended when the temple was destroyed. But biblically, New Testament record, they didn't have to be done because the veil was torn when Jesus said it is finished. He bowed his head, he gave up the ghost. And the veil was torn from top to bottom, that the way into the Holy of Holies was accessible because the one sacrifice for sin, to expiate sin, was made and done and accepted. Animal sacrifices could never expiate sin, according to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 11. The blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. Because if they could, why did they have to keep doing it? If it worked, why do I have to keep doing this? But Christ's sacrificial work was done. It was completed. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12 
by which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And that's why it's a blasphemous thing to do the Mass in the Catholic Church, because they have an ongoing sacrifice. There's no need for that. You are saying that Jesus' sacrifice was not enough. They didn't do the job. But once for all. Once for all. And when he had completed this, when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, the place of honor. And there is no higher place of honor. So God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, and by whom also he made the worlds. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Father, today, just in this passage, this short passage, I think we got a little glimpse of the greatness of our Savior. And this great creator God became one of us. And not a grand and glorious one, but one that it says there was no beauty that we should desire him. And he came and was abused and mocked and ridiculed and died to fulfill what Adam did not. To pay the penalty of our sin that we might have forgiveness. Lord, that paradise might be restored. And Father, this can be ours. Thank you. Simply by receiving the gift, the offer of salvation that Christ paid for. Father, thank you. We pray for Christ's sake. Amen.